Hello, everybody, and welcome back to BioSC 140. We're really getting the semester going now. This is material for lecture exam one. It is day two lecture, S1P2, section one, part two, bonds, functional groups, and biomolecules. Well, let's get into it. So chemical bonds. Uh, chemical bonds have four main types. Well, three main types with one of them has two subcategories that are important to human physiology, that are important to what we're talking about here. So first off, what is a chemical bond? A chemical bond is a favorable energetic relationship. It's a favorable energy Basically, what I'm getting at is it's not like a physical, it's, it's not necessarily a, a physical connection. Like there's no bridge between the two atoms within a, a chemical bond, within a molecule, two atoms that are bonded together. It's a, in, it's a relationship, it's a situation where it's energetically favorable for those atoms to like stick together, to be bonded together. So these are the types that we're going to talk about that are important for this class. Let's start off with covalent bonds. So covalent bonds are an equal or about equal sharing of electrons. That's a good way to think about it. You have an atom on the right. You have an atom on the left. You have a couple electrons that kind of just hang out somewhere in the middle between the two of them. Sometimes it's completely equal. Sometimes it's not completely equal. We talk about those two different types when we talk about the subtypes. So right here we have our Lewis dot structures. A lot of this should be review from general chemistry. Um, please review general chemistry if you need to. There is a lecture um, uploaded that is not going to have a lecture video on it but it has some basic general chemistry that you should have had in your prereqs. Um, that'll be like a refresher. And Lewis dot structure is, is in there. Um, you should know what a valence electron is. Right here we have hydrogen with one valence, hydrogen with one valence. They bond together covalently. They share their valence electron and they fill their most outer shell, the S shell, and they have the two electrons within it, which makes it a complete shell should make sense. So since hydrogen atoms are sharing electrons equally, this is a nonpolar covalent. So right there is that first subtype that we saw in the previous slide, the nonpolar covalent. So nonpolar covalent bonds are covalent bonds where the electrons are shared generally equally, the first half of this definition. The first half of this definition where it says an equal sharing of electrons. And why is this important? Well, hydrogen and hydrogen both have relatively similar electronegativities. Electronegativity is the amount of, the amount of pull, the strength of the pull of electrons towards that atom. And hydrogen and hydrogen are the same atom. So they have the same electronegativity. And so the pull, the attraction they have for electrons is roughly the same. The electrons are equally shared between the two hydrogens. So here we have methane, CH4, which is another, which is a molecule that's going to have four nonpolar covalent bonds in it. So we have a carbon bonded to four different hydrogens. Hydrogen and carbon have roughly the same electronegativity, roughly the same amount of pull um, on the electrons surrounding them. So carbon and hydrogen, hydrogen share electrons very equally. Therefore, they tend to form nonpolar covalents. This is important. They share the electrons evenly. Let's see what happens when there's no even sharing of electrons. When we have a polar covalent bond. So right here we have water, H2O, two hydrogens and an oxygen. Oxygen is very electronegative. Oxygen is greedy for electrons. Oxygen has a strong attraction for
for electrons. It's going to pull electrons close to it. It's much stronger than hydrogen at pulling electrons close to it. So when oxygen binds with hydrogen, it's going to pull those electrons closer to it. It's still sharing the electrons, but it's an unequal sharing. It's like, it's like when I was little and my brother would share toys, right? You know, he play, got to play with the, the video games 90% of the time, and I got them like 10% of the time. Um, bad analogy. Uh, so well, oxygen is very electronegative. It's pulling the electrons closer to it. What is the charge on electrons? Electrons each have a negative charge. Electrons are going to hang out closer to the oxygen. So there's going to be more negative charge hanging out closer to the oxygen and less negative charge hanging out close to the hydrogens. This is going to cause an uneven distribution of charge throughout the molecule. Let me repeat that. The polar covalent bond is going to happen. It's going to occur when one atom in the bonding pair is highly electronegative. It's going to pull the electrons closer to it, leading to an uneven distribution of electrons and therefore an uneven distribution of charges throughout the molecule. In methane, even distribution of electrons, even distribution of charge. Water, uneven distribution of electrons, uneven distribution of charge. Polar refers to the presence of an uneven distribution of charge. Right here, water, the electrons are closer to the oxygen. The oxygen molecule has more electrons around it. It has a negative slight negative charge to it. Hydrogens are missing. They have less of those electrons near them. They're going to be slightly positive. There is a polarity to water because there's overall the molecule is neutral. But within the molecule, the electrons hang out closer to the oxygen, so there's a slight negative charge further away from the hydrogen, so there's a slight positive charge. Atoms can share more than one pair of electrons, thus forming double and triple bonds, a double covalence like O2. So the first, let's kind of review a little bit. Covalent bonds, the sharing of electrons. Nonpolar covalent, when there's no, when there's an even charge distribution throughout that molecule, then the electrons are shared evenly because there's similar electronegativity amongst the involved atoms. Polar covalent, uneven sharing of electrons, charge distribution, one atom is more electrically negative than the other one. On to the next type, ionic bonds. Ionic bonds, are when one atom pretty much completely takes the electron of another's. So right here, we have sodium with one valence electron, and the chlorine atom has seven valence electron at once eight. Sodium is gonna completely give up its outer valence electron. Chlorine is gonna completely take it. We're gonna end up with a completely positive charge, one positive charge under sodium, one positive charge, the sodium ion, and chlorine is going to change its name to chloride ion, and it's going to have a negative charge. Negative. Sodium chloride, that's salt. So the electrostatic attraction of sodium and chlor uh, positive sodium ion and negative chloride ion is the ionic bond. So chlorine steals the electron, sodium becomes positive, chlorine becomes negative, the charge, the positive and negative charge are attracted. Now, in ionic bonds, something I want to point out is that pure sodium and pure chlorine are very different than when they come together and form this ionic bond. 
So sodium chloride is something that we put on our food all the time. It's table salt and we eat it all the time and it's, we need it. Sodium, pure sodium, pure sodium metal looks like this on the bottom left. And its properties are very different than table salt. If you drop table salt in water, what happens? The sodium, the chlorine dissociate and you get salt water. It's like an ocean, it's fine. When you drop pure sodium metal in water, it's, it actually responds violently and, and can explode on YouTube it. YouTube dropping sodium metal into water, it, it goes boom. It reacts violently. Chlorine, pure chlorine gas, this yellow in the middle is super toxic. Chlorine gas, yeah, you don't want to breathe it in. It's not good for life. Very toxic. But you combine the two ionically, you get table salt, which we eat every day. Hydrogen bonding is the last type of bonding, and I feel like this is the one that students have the most trouble getting. But really, it's pretty simple. We're, we're going to get this. So hydrogen bonding requires hydrogens, hence the name. When hydrogen is covalently bonded to an electro, a very electronegative atom. So in this class, pretty much always oxygen, nitrogen, oxygen or nitrogen, sometimes phosphorus. Um, I, for this class, oxygen and nitrogen. Um, oxygen and nitrogen are strongly electronegative. They're going to pull the electrons close to them so that there's a slight negative charge on the oxygen or nitrogen and a slight positive charge on the hydrogen. That slight positive charge on the hydrogen can be attracted to a slight negative charge or negative charge on another molecule. And it's that intermolecular attraction that is the hydrogen bond. It's that partial slight positive charge on a hydrogen being attracted to a slight negative charge on a different molecule, sometimes a different part of the same molecule, but different molecule. So hydrogen bond right there. And guess what? Water is full of, I mean, if you have a glass of water, it's full of water molecules, and each water molecule is forming multiple hydrogen bonds with other water molecules. So right down here, you can see the slight positive charge of the H2O molecule on the hydrogen having a hydrogen bond with the slight negative oxygen molecule, oxygen part of a different water molecule. So which type of bond is the strongest? Which type of bond is the weakest? Well, all right, so which type of bond is the strongest? Which type of bond is the weakest? All right. So I want to make something clear because your geology teacher might tell you something different than your physiology teacher. And I'm going to explain why your physiology teacher might say something different than your geology teacher. Humans. What is, what are humans mostly made up of? Most of our body is water. Water makes up most of our bodies. Our bodies are a, a watery environment. In the presence of water, when dissolved in water in the human body, covalent bonds are the strongest types of bonds. Think about table salt. When you put table salt in water, the sodium and chloride, uh, chloride ion dissociate. They break apart they break apart. Covalent bonds in the human physiology in the human body are going to be your strongest. Ionic bonds are going to be in the middle with hydrogen being the weakest. This can change when outside of an aqueous situation. Your geology teacher might argue that ionic bonds are at the top. But in this class, it's going to be the covalent. All right, functional groups. So functional groups. 
functional groups, you don't need to memorize them, but I'm gonna point them out because I want you to be able to identify polar and nonpolar bonds when looking at a molecule. Polarity is super important to human physiology and it's super important to this class and it's super important to being successful in this class to be able to identify a polar bond when you see it. So right here we have our hydroxyl functional group. It's oxygen bounded to a hydrogen. Oxygen is very electronegative. It's going to pull the electrons closer to it. You're going to have a slight negative charge on the oxygen, slight positive charge on the hydrogen. It's going to be a polar bond. Now, hydroxyl functional group, um, you'll see it written OH with this R. R is like the rest of a molecule. So it could be the example right here, it could be ethanol where it's two, a two carbon chain bound to the hydroxyl group, but really it could be any molecule, any rest of the molecule. What kind of bond is it between the oxygen and the hydrogen? Polar covalent. I want you to really recognize that it's a polar covalent bond, that there's some polarity to it. Right here, we have carbonyl and carboxyl groups, carbonyl and carboxyl groups. With the carboxyl group, it actually holds on to this hydrogen very weakly, very weakly. And that hydrogen can come off super easy. And when that carbon comes off, you get a negative charge. That negative charged functional group is going to function kind of polarity, it adds some charge to it, adds some charge to it. And we're gonna see these quite often when we start talking about biomolecules and uh, connecting different biomolecules together. Um, the carboxyl group will be coming really handy when combining um, you know, amino acids together and fatty acids together. So those will come up in a handful of slides. Uh, the amino group is going to come up when we talk about amino acids. Uh, but the amino group, that's NH2, NH2. Sometimes in some situations, you can actually add in another hydrogen ion to that uh, nitrogen, which is going to make it a little bit positive. You're going to add an extra proton onto it, an extra hydrogen ion, and you're going to get a positive charge. Um, but these will come in play when we talk about amino acids. Phosphate functional group, um, what I want you to notice about this is you're gonna have a lot of negative charges around it. Phosphate groups have a lot of negative charges around it. Uh, we're gonna talk about these, we talk about DNA, RNA, and ATP in a little while. And main thing, once again, a lot of negative charges. You don't need to memorize functional groups, uh, but be able to recognize some properties of them. Methyl, methyl functional group, again, what kind of bonds are formed between carbon and hydrogen? I'm gonna give you a clue. Carbon and hydrogen have similar electronegativities. Similar electronegativities. Similar electronegativities means non-polar covalent. They have the same force of attraction for electrons because they've got the same force of electron for electrons. They're going to share the electrons evenly, even charge distribution. Organic molecules. Uh, we're gonna get to this question down here in a little bit. Uh, organic molecules. So you should know what an organic molecule is. Molecules containing carbon and hydrogen are considered to be organic molecules. Basically anything with carbon except for carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide are considered them. The four biomolecules are the large molecules necessary for life. They all contain carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Additionally, some add in nitrogen or phosphorus. So chance is actually C-H-O-N-P, chomps, yeah. All right, so these are the four main 
biomolecules. The rest of this lecture, we're going to talk about the four main biomolecules, and we're going to talk about these pretty steadily throughout the whole semester. Think of these as the building blocks for the molecules that make you up. I'm going to make an analogy. So carbohydrates, you could think of as Legos. You put different Legos together, you can form a big structure. Think of lipids then as like a competing brand, a competing brand of kids building toys. So like Lincoln Logs, if you know what they are. They're like Legos, but made by a different company. You can put little tiny Lincoln Logs together and form different structures. Proteins could be like Connects, another brand of you know, building materials where you have small pieces that you put together to build up a large molecule and so on. So you have carbohydrates. Carbohydrates have their small building blocks called monomers. Mono means like one. So monomer is like a one unit. Carbohydrate monomers, you can bind carbohydrate monomers together and you get large carbohydrate molecules. Lipids. You have your monomers of lipids. You can bind them together. You get large polymers, poly meaning many polymers of lipids and so on. So let's, let's dive into each one of these. So the monomer, I asked this test question. It's going to be on a checkup. It's going to be on the test. Be ready for it. Just give me a heads up. Um, the, I want you to know the monomer of each main type of organic molecule. So I want you to know the monomer of carbohydrates, the monomer of lipids and proteins and so on. So the monomer of carbohydrates is going to be the monosaccharide. Saccharide refers to sugar, so the one sugar, monosaccharide. Polysaccharide is going to be a chain of these monosaccharides, a chain of carbohydrates. Um, if two monomers are together, sorry, two saccharides are to, um, joined together, what is that called? It's actually called a disaccharide, di meaning two, disaccharide. Polymer is going to be about four or more, polysaccharide is about four or more. So monosaccharide one, disaccharide two, monomers combined together, polysaccharide is going to be many. And these you're going to find, uh, a lot of people think of carbohydrates as an energy source. And yes, carbohydrates, they are energy stored in, in polysaccharides and carbohydrates. Um, it also is, forms some structure and some signaling uh, functions also, some structural and signaling functions also. The monomer for lipids is going to be the fatty acid. The monomer for lipids is going to be the fatty acid. Um, lipids are very functionally diverse. Um, you use them for energy, insulation, uh, cell membranes, hormones. So, you know, people think of fat, they think of energy, you know, yeah, go run so you can lose some, some, some fat, some lipids. Um, so energy storage, um, our cell membranes are made out of lipids. We're going to get into that next lecture. Also, a lot of hormones are fat-based. A lot of hormones are fat-based. When we talk about hormones, we're going to learn which ones are or a number of them that are. Amino acid is the monomer for a polypeptide or a protein. Polypeptide is another name for, well, for a protein. We're going to get into that, though. Um, proteins are very functionally diverse. Um, some proteins are enzymes. Some proteins are for structure, like, um, like collagen. Um, some proteins are hormones. Some proteins carry smaller molecules, antibodies, gene regulation, uh, movement, all for amino acids. Nucleotides. So a nucleotide is the monomer of a nucleic acid. And nucleic acids, most people think of DNA or RNA, uh, but also ATP is a nucleic acid. So let's get into these a little bit more. So polymer means many mer, like many small pieces together, monomer, like a one piece, 
let's look at how we can connect these small pieces into this large chain to make an even larger chain. So this is how it's gonna work for most of these building blocks, most of these monomers. We're gonna have what's called a dehydration reaction. So D meaning like, like dehumidify, like to reduce. You're gonna take a water out, dehydration reaction. It's a taking a water out reaction. So we're gonna have this OH group on the short polymer. We're gonna have this hydrogen on the monomer. We're gonna combine this OH with this H to form H2O. And when we remove that H2O from the combined molecules, it's gonna combine them together into a larger polymer. This is called a dehydration reaction, also called a synthesis or condensation reaction. Synthesis or condensation reaction. Know those terms. I have asked questions about those terms on tests before. No, I like using different names. Dehydration, synthesis, and condensation are all terms for this type of reaction. So the opposite can also be done. How do you break these polymer chains apart? How do you separate? How do you, yeah, how do you break these polymer chains apart? Well, with a hydrolysis, hydrolysis reaction. So lysis means to cleave or to break apart. That term's gonna come up a lot this semester. So you're gonna use hydro, referring to water, to lyse, referring to break apart or to cleave apart. So water breaking apart. You're gonna break apart this bond by inserting a water. You're gonna break apart this bond, you're gonna cleave this bond by adding in a water. Remember how I told you that I like breaking the words down? Breaking the word down tells you what it does. So you separate this chain of polymers into two smaller chains by cleaving it apart with a water molecule. Right here's an example with carbohydrates. So we have a glucose monomer or monosaccharide and another glucose monomer or glucose monosaccharide. Be ready for those terms, monosaccharide monomer. And we're gonna have a condensation reaction happen. We're gonna take the OH here on this glucose and this H here on this glucose, and we're gonna take water out, and we're gonna combine them into a disaccharide, or two sugars combined, two saccharides combined, uh, called maltose. So if you bind two glucoses together via dehydration reaction, you actually get a maltose. So dehydration reaction and the synthesis of maltose. Maltose is a disaccharide. Let's look at another example. Glucose is a monosaccharide and fructose is a monosaccharide. Also, it's another type of Lego, another type of monosaccharide. When you combine them together via a dehydration reaction or condensation reaction, you get sucrose. Sucrose is a disaccharide. A lot of us know about lactose. Um, my wife is lactose intolerant. Many of you might be lactose intolerant. Um, lactose is a disaccharide. And it's a, when you combine a glucose which is a monosaccharide, with a galactose, which is another type of monosaccharide, you combine them via a dehydration reaction and you get lactose. Um, my wife does not have the enzyme required to break this bond apart right here in a lactose molecule. What would that be called? That would be called a hydrolysis reaction. My wife cannot, does not have the enzyme required to do a hydrolysis reaction on a lactose disaccharide. Other polysaccharides in plants, large polysaccharides are called starches. They're a, an energy storage molecule in plants. Think potatoes. There's lots of energy in potatoes. Uh, and potatoes are considered starchy. Um, it, comes from carbohydrates. It comes from this polymer, this polysaccharide, this polysaccharide starch. Glycogen 
is the carbohydrate storage molecule for energy in humans. We're going to talk about glycogen a lot this semester. Glycogen is a polysaccharide. So glycogen is a polysaccharide. It's many sugars combined together. And it's very important to human physiology. Um, you can think of it as the analogous to starch. Um, most humans, most of us are familiar with starch and how it's an energy storage molecule for plants. Well, glycogen is the carbohydrate energy storage molecule for humans. Cellulose is another common polysaccharide. It's more for structure than it is for energy storage, though, in plants. It's in the cell wall of, of cell plant, plant cells. So depending on their structure, dietary carbohydrates can lead to quick but brief or slow but persistent increases in sugar. So fresh fruit, like an orange, is sweet. It has a lot of simple sugars. It has a lot of monosaccharides and disaccharides. Think fructose. Fructose is a monosaccharide. Those monosaccharides get into our bloodstream quickly. They don't need to be broken down so much. So we get a big boost in our blood sugar, and then it comes back down. We get a big spike. Complex carbohydrates, like <laughs> in this oatmeal, they're polysaccharides. Oatmeals are full of polysaccharides, not monosaccharides. And so it, we, they take longer to break down. There's a more steady breakdown within our body, and the boost in our blood sugar that we get is a slower boost and a more sustained boost. Um, let's think about bananas. So bananas, when you eat a green banana, it's a little tougher, right? It's a little more fibrous and it's not as sweet. Green bananas have more complex carbohydrates, more, more polysaccharides than a very yellow banana or with a more ripe banana. As the banana ripens, some, a lot of those polysaccharides are gonna be broken down into more simple sugars like fructose, making it more sweet. Um, can a cow break down cellulose? Can humans break down cellulose? So what's cellulose again? It's a complex carbohydrate. It's a polysaccharide that's found in cell plant walls. Actually, no, humans, and cows, mammals actually, cannot break down, they cannot break the bonds between the sugars in cellulose. But we have bacteria in our bodies that can. Cows have bacteria that can break down cellulose. And by break down cellulose, I mean do the hydrolyse reaction, um, catalyze the hydrolyse reaction that breaks apart those polysaccharides. Um, bacteria can do it but mammals can't. Mammals have bacteria in their guts that can do it. Cows have back the bacteria, and so do humans. So when I eat broccoli, I love broccoli, eat a lot of broccoli. The cell walls present in that broccoli are broken down by bacteria. Moving on to lipids. So lipids are the most structurally diverse biomolecules. Lipids are nonpolar. Um, let me go back a second. So these sugars, look at all those OHs. Look at all those OHs. That's going to make sugars polar. Sugars are going to be polar. When you put sugar in water, it dissolves. It's polar. Lipids are going to be pretty much nonpolar. Pretty much nonpolar. So I am going to kind of throw something in there. We talk about polar and nonpolar pretty much every class this entire semester. It's really important. And one main reason for it is that polar molecules like to mix with other polar molecules and nonpolar molecules like to mix with nonpolar molecules. So vinegar and water are both polar. They like to mix. Ethanol and water are both polar. They like to mix. Oil, like vegetable oil and water, vegetable oil is nonpolar. Oils are nonpolar. Water is polar. 
oil and water do not mix well because one's nonpolar and one's polar. Polar molecules mix with polar molecules. Nonpolar molecules mix with nonpolar molecules. Lipids are considered hydrophobic. Let's break that word down. So hydro refers to water. Phobic means like fear, like arachnophobia. Phobic means fear. So lipids are water fearing. Lipids do not mix with water because water is polar and lipids are nonpolar. Uh, lipids are most, mostly hydrocarbons. Let's break that down. Hydrogen, carbon, um, carbons. They're mostly C's and H's. Um, butter are as lipids. Um, wax, like a beeswax, are lipids. Why is Barry Bonds on this slide? Well, because steroids, remember how some hormones are, some hormones are lipids? Steroids are lipids. So subclasses of lipids, fatty acids, that's the fundamental unit. Triglycerides, which we're gonna talk about in a moment. Phospholipids, which make up your cell membranes. And steroids, which are a type of hormone, are all lipids. So right here we have a lipid. Right here we have a fatty acid. Now let's look at this fatty acid. Carbon and hydrogen, carbon and hydrogen, carbon and hydrogen, carbon and hydrogen for most of the molecule. What do we know about carbon and hydrogen when they're bonded together? They share electrons evenly. They share electrons evenly, they're nonpolar. Over here we have some oxygens. Now oxygen and hydrogen are going to unevenly share electrons. So there will be some polarity to this aspect of the molecule, but the rest of the molecule is so large and so nonpolar that this molecule is gonna act very nonpolar. So despite this little bit of polarity here on this molecule, it's gonna be a very nonpolar molecule. So fatty acids have methyl groups and carbonyl groups at the end. So methyl groups are all nonpolar, a little bit of polarity with the carbonyl group. So triglyceride, uh, this is triglyceride right here, one type of lipid that we're gonna talk about, triglyceride. So the triglyceride is gonna have two main components. It's gonna have fatty acids, and it's gonna have glycerol. So palmitic acid is the type of this one specific fatty acid. There's lots of different types of fatty acids, but they all look like this. They all have long chains of carbons attached to a functional group like this. And then glycerol. Glycerol is, every glycerol and triglyceride is gonna look just like this. It's gonna have three carbons attached to OH groups. Three carbons attached to OH groups. Now, remember the dehydration reaction. We're gonna have the hydrogen from these OH groups on the glycerol bind to or have a dehydration reaction with the OH on this functional group on the fatty acid, binding them together. So we have a dehydration reaction, remove the water out, and it's gonna combine these monomers. See what I did there, these monomers. We're gonna have, so that's how these fatty acid chains are gonna to bind to a glycerol. So why is it called a triglyceride? Well, it's called a triglyceride because there's three carbons on a glycerol, we can have three fatty acids bind to it. So this is a triglyceride, this is a fat molecule. This is a triglyceride, this is a fat molecule. Fat molecules, triglycerides are made up of these three carbon, this three carbon glycerol molecule bound to three fatty acids, bound to three fatty acids. As you can see here, each fatty acid is different. There's lots of different types of fatty acids and different fatty acids will bind to glycerol molecules. So, would you want a long-term energy storage molecule to be acidic? Well, it's this acidic hydrogen right here, this functional group that allows for it to be, 
to bind to a glycerol. It allows it to form these um, polymers, polymers, and that's why it's beneficial to have the stored energy storage molecule be acidic. Um, how many fatty acids can be attached to one glycerol molecule? So glycerol has three OH groups, three carbons. One fatty acid can bind to each one of them. So three fatty acids can bind to one glycerol. Triglyceride, tri meaning three, and then glycerol, glycerol. All right, so before we get into answering these questions, let's look at something. So we've probably heard these terms before, a saturated fat or an unsaturated fat. Saturated fats, a saturated fat is one where there's no double bonds. So right here on these top two triglycerides, you can see that there's no double bonds between any carbons. That is a saturated fatty acid. Saturated fatty acid, no double bonds. Unsaturated means that there is a double bond within the carbon chain. A double bond within the carbon chain. So saturated, no double bonds. Unsaturated, means there are double bonds. And what that double bond does is it actually will cause the fatty acid chain to bend. You can see it here in this slide. That double bond causes the fatty acid chain to bend. And when you have a lot of these triglycerides packed together, when there's uh, double bonds and curves in the chain, it causes them to not pack together as tightly. They don't fit together as tightly. And so when you have a lot of saturated fatty acids, they, their, their fatty acid chains are straight, they pack closely together, they stick together well, you get lard and butter. Lard and butter are solid at room temperature, and in layman's terms, in general terms, we call them fat. So triglycerides that are solid at room temperature, we call fats. They're solid because they're saturated. They have no or few double bonds. Oils, oils are liquids at room temperature. They're liquids at room temperature because their fatty acid tails have lots of bends in them, so they don't pack closely together. They don't fit closely together. So right here we have butter. Butter, the fatty acids are mainly straight. They're going to be saturated. Olive oil here is going to have a lot of bends in their fatty acid tails. Lots of bends in their fatty acid tails which allows them to not pack tightly together. They have bent fatty acid tails. Now, in a few slides, you might have seen this term cis come up, and you've probably heard of the term trans fat. Trans fat. So, in all naturally occurring fatty acids where there are double bonds, those double bonds are set up in such a way that they cause that bend in the fatty acid chain. This orientation of the bond is called a cis isomer or a cis bond. A cis bond. Double bonds in fatty acid chains, it's possible to have them set up in a trans, in a trans isomer, a trans configuration. And a trans configuration allows the fatty acid chain to have a double bond, but no bend to the chain. The chain will remain straight. You only get these trans isomers in a lab. They don't happen naturally. We can make them happen because we're humans and scientists and smart like that, 
but they don't happen naturally. They happen in a test tube. They happen because of human interference. Naturally occurring fatty acids are in the cis configuration. They're bent. Trans fatty acids are straight, just like saturated fatty acids. Another subcategory of lipids are uh, your steroids. Estradiol is a steroid, it's a hormone. Testosterone is a hormone. There are lipid-based hormones. Proteins. Proteins are polymers of amino acids. So you can connect a bunch of amino acids together and you get proteins. Proteins all have a similar structure and I want you to know the structure um, actually, all amino acids have similar structure, and I want you to know the structure of amino acids. We're going to talk a lot about these in lab also. Um, I believe it's lab four we're going to talk a lot about uh, proteins and amino acids. So let's look at the structure of an amino acid. All amino acids are going to have this general structure. They're going to have what's called an alpha carbon. Right up here, alpha, central alpha carbon. The central alpha carbon right here in the middle is going to have a carboxyl group attached to it right here. Remember, carboxyl groups, this hydrogen here is acidic. That's where the name amino acid comes from. Acid comes from this acid right here, this acidic hydrogen. All amino acids are going to have this amino group right here, this NH2. That's where the amine in the amino acid name is going to come from. So amino, referring to the amino group attached to the carbon, the alpha carbon. Acid, coming from the carboxyl group, coming attached to this carbon. What's going to make amino acid, one amino acid different from another amino acid, is what's called the side group or the R group. So all amino acids have this amino group, alpha carbon, and carboxyl group. What makes them different is this side group, and the side groups vary pretty widely from amino acid to amino acid. Now, remember the amino groups when we talked about functional groups, they can accept a hydrogen. Remember when we talked about the carboxyl group, they can lose this hydrogen. Well, in amino acids, we're actually going to connect we're actually going to connect the carboxyl group with the amino group. So the way it's going to work is we're going to take this hydrogen, one of the hydrogens on the nitrogen, we're going to take this OH, we're going to do a dehydration reaction, and we're going to combine amino acids that way. We're going to combine amino acids by taking this OH and one of these H's and combining them that way, dehydration reaction. So here are the 20 amino acids. You can see they all have alpha carbons, they all have amino groups, they all have carboxyl groups, they all have different R chains, they all have different side chains, which is what makes them different. Dehydration reaction is what combines them together. So two amino acids are joined or called a dipeptide. So there's the, the word, uh, the, if you break the word down, di means two. Peptide refers to amino acids. So a dipeptide would be two amino acids combined together. What would you call 100 amino acids joined together? Well, you'd call them a polypeptide. Remember, poly means many, polypeptide. Proteins do a lot of different things. Proteins have many functions, from enzymatic functions to structural, um, functions like collagen or elastin to storage proteins, transport proteins, hormones, receptors, lots of functions. So this next concept, some students have been exposed to before, some have not. We're going to talk about the different levels of structure for proteins. So proteins are polypeptides. There's a lot, there are lots of different uh, amino acids combined together. So right here is a long chain of amino acids. The primary structure, when talking about 
proteins, I'm gonna talk about different levels of structure, primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary. When I talk about primary structure of a protein, I'm talking about the order of amino acids. So lysine attached to valine and so on. What is the order of the amino acids within the chain? Does primary structure matter? Does order matter? Absolutely it does. Sickle cell anemia, we'll talk about a few times this semester, but most people have heard of sickle cell anemia. Um, you should definitely be familiar with sickle cell anemia by the time you leave this class. It's pretty present, pretty prevalent within our community. Sickle cell anemia is caused by a single change in amino acid. It's caused by a one amino acid change in a hemoglobin molecule instead of, uh, so one amino acid is changed. So there's a change in primary structure. Secondary structure refers to local folding. So remember, proteins are three-dimensional things. Form and function matter. The three-dimensional shape of a protein matters to its function. Secondary structure is like the local structure. What's the shape, what's the folding of the chain, the polypeptide chain in a local area? It could be an alpha helix, a twirly curly Q like this right here. It could also be a pleated sheet like this right here. Tertiary structure refers to the whole amino, the whole polypeptide chain. So primary structure, what is the order of amino acids? Secondary structure, how does that chain fold in a local, in a local area? Tertiary structure, what is the shape of that whole chain, that whole chain? When we get to quaternary structure of a protein, we're gonna be talking about multiple polypeptides. So multiple amino acid chains coming together. Um, insulin, for instance, is a, it's two separate polypeptide chains, each with their own secondary and tertiary structure, coming together to form insulin with its quaternary structure. So different chains coming together to form a complete protein. Different polypeptide subunits. Right here, this molecule, this protein, has four polypeptide subunits. Moving on to nucleic acids. So nucleic acids, there's gonna be really three main things. DNA, RNA, and then ATP. Nucleic acids, you're gonna have a sugar, a phosphate, and then what's called a nitrogenous base, nitrogenous base. So right here, you can see the building blocks for DNA and RNA. All of them have the phosphate. All DNA and RNA, they all have the sugar. Um, the sugar is what separates DNA, one of the main things that separates DNA from RNA. DNA has deoxyribose, so ribose is a type of sugar, deoxyribose in DNA. And then ribonucleic, they have a ribose for uh, RNA, and then a nitrogenous base, so three main components. Each one of these components, these building blocks, are gonna to come together to form the double helix that is uh, DNA. These bases, these are like the, uh, the building blocks, the Legos for DNA. So basically DNA and RNA, very similar structure, nitrogenous base, sugar with a phosphate group. And then you form polymers out of these these building blocks. ATP is another type of nucleic acid. It's gonna have your adenosine, so ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. We're gonna talk about ATP, adenosine triphosphate, a lot in this class. Um, ATP is, it's how you put energy into a chemical reaction. 
It's one of the main ways you put energy into a chemical reaction. It's how you, you power chemical reactions within your body, within a human. It's going to have an adenis, uh, adenine, so adenosine and adenine. It's going to be bound to a ribose, bound to a ribose, just like up here in DNA and RNA. And it's going to be bound to some phosphate groups. Now, in DNA and RNA, you're just going to have the one phosphate. With ATP, you're going to have three phosphates. Now, what I want you to notice is all of these negative charges on these three phosphate groups. Remember, negative charges push apart from each other. There's a lot of energy stored up in these bonds that are holding these three phosphate groups together. Those negative charges want to push apart, but those strong bonds are holding them together. When you slice off one of these phosphates, it's going to get propelled off with a lot of energy because of all those negative charges. When you, the way you power a, the way you give energy to a chemical reaction in the human body, one of the main ways is by slicing off that third phosphate. All these phosphates want to push apart. When you slice one of them off, you let it shoot off with a lot of energy, and you turn that main molecule into ADP, adenosine diphosphate. So adenosine triphosphate, trimine three phosphate, three phosphate groups. You turn adenosine diphosphate, dimine two phosphate groups. Uh, with ATP and ADP, there's a cycle where you use ATP to do cellular work, turn it into ADP. You then eat food and your mitochondria and a few other mechanisms, turn your ADP back into ATP. So it's like a cycle. You use ATP to power um, reactions. You then eat food and digest that food and turn your ADP back into ATP to power more reactions. Here's the summary chart. Whenever you see a summary chart, know it. Um, just a little tip, know this summary chart. And let's move on. All right, um, well, I'm gonna add in one thing else, one other thing. This column right here about the kilocalories per gram, we're going to talk about that in a later date. So at this point, you don't need to know this column, but you should definitely know biomolecule column, know the structure column, know the polarity, know the function, and definitely know the fundamental unit. I always ask a question about the fundamental unit. And with that note on that, please email me if you have any questions. This is concluding the uh, lecture two.